I'm sorry you had to get a finish dinner today. I'm grateful to do this though, because I love speaking for the students and helping people in career development, being talented, which I've done this a lot of some of the other universities around here. And I, I'm i glad when students are engaging in this way in these types of classes, because the job market is ever shifting all of the time. And so the more you just get a general survey of what's out there, the better it is for you, because you will pursue a lot of different pathways and those pathways will converge over time. You'll have a lot of different kinds of opportunities in front of you. And it may not be just in one career track. Do you guys know how many career tracks people on average will likely have in their lifetime? You ever heard this step? They're guessing millennials and Gen Z will have about five different career paths in their lifetime. That's uh, just fairly common. Sometimes they say it's as much as seven, just because job market shift, people sometimes they'll get into something. And this this definitely happened to me, although I was about three years into school and I would maybe I know rest of development. Michelle, okay, <laughs> Joe, okay, I made a huge mistake. About three years into my undergrad program, I was like, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, this is not what I want to do long term. And I know many, many people who have had that kind of realization after they entered their their first couple of jobs in their career field. They said, it seemed great, but I'm a little weary of some things in this industry. So they go explore something else. So what I would what I would tell you, no matter you know, you're, you're going to get some very detailed things from today, and I hope you you ask questions. I, I want to be as helpful as possible, but please keep in mind that you are a person that can gain many skills over time. So whatever you choose now, just be open-minded to other pivots, pathways you can take. And there's a lot of joy in that, in that journey over time too. So, sorry about using trite statements like Joanne's the journey. All right, well, I'm gonna jump in. There we go, I'll jump in and um, talk a little bit more about two different, uh, a little bit about two different industries. The first one is the insurance industry. And the second one is, my field of practice, which is, of course, talent acquisition or, or essentially HR. Happy to go into any background there. One of the things I will say as well is who, well, I'll ask, who has a LinkedIn account right now, LinkedIn profile? Yes, good. If you don't have one, I hope you create it today. One of the things I've often told students is they're underutilizing their LinkedIn accounts right now. So I'll invite you, if you want to connect with me, I'm more than happy to connect with you. Send me an invite, pretty easy to find, J.D. Conway, to Toronto, Utah, whatever it is. So I'm really happy to do that. And, and I, I just, I want students to be able to continually network with folks because that's how you so often find new job opportunities, find out more about fields, and it should extend beyond this, this room or this, this lecture and this uh, lecture series. So I, I worked for, or I, I was on the board for Utah SHRM in college relations. SHRM is the Society for Human Resource Management. The national organization is about a half million people. And the state level board, they had me over college relations because so I was just so passionate about helping everybody out in their early careers now. So even afterwards, let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so a little bit about just the, the insurance industry, the next slide is insurance industry is not something that people go, oh my gosh, I'm dying to get an insurance. Nobody grows up as a six-year-old and they're like, I want to be an insurance broker, right? So it, it helps to talk a little bit more about some differences in the insurance industry. I'm going to share some stats that are going to surprise you, I think. First one is there's insurance brokers and insurance carriers as companies and organizations. You guys know the difference. What do you know? differences that most people don't. So I'd be shocked if there was somebody in here that did, unless their family member was a broker or something. So insurance carriers are places like, uh, let's say the Hartford, if you've seen their, their ads on TV or something like that. The insurance carriers are the people that actually fulfill the underwriting of an of a insurance policy. They might insure one particular area like housing, like they do home insurance specifically. They might do other property and casualty in the business world those kinds of things, those are carriers. Brokers are people that essentially, they represent the clients really well. So at PCF, we're a broker, and we'll go to the carriers and we'll say, hey, carrier, Hartford, whoever it is, we have, well, I don't know, 
30,000 business owners that all need this kind of insurance. You want some of that, don't you? You should give us a discount so we can pass those discounts over to them. We, in, in many ways, represent the needs of the client. So we'll go to a business owner and say, okay, you need liability insurance, basic liability stuff in case somebody slips on the floor and tries to sue you and like you have some coverage there and things like that. There's a lot of different ways that brokers can insure people. So think about any kind of insurance that's out there. Brokers can be in and uh, in that and involved in that. PCF specifically is interesting because we're a huge broker and we're in Utah. There's not that many big brokerages in Utah, right? There's, let's say, a, a larger one is Levitt Group down based out of Cedar City. And then other than that, most of them are East Coast based, Chicago based, those kinds of things. You have one in Newport Beach in the top 20 grouping. So here's a little bit more about PCF itself. We're about 900 million in revenue. Most of that is through mergers and acquisitions. Has anybody studied that yet? Looked into that at all? Okay. Yeah. Mergers and acquisitions, very interesting field. One of the things I thought was very interesting about this place too, I keep reading about small businesses and all kinds of different businesses that baby boomers are, are trying to actually sell off their businesses and retire and nobody's buying their businesses. I think like one in 12 gets bought or something like that at this point. In this world, there's insurance brokerages. Anybody can start an insurance brokerage or an agency as it were. And so what PCF does is we have a, a, an M&A team that scouts out and looks at places, looks at their EBITDA numbers. Does anybody know what EBITDA is or stands for? Anybody? Know? Okay. I saw them out here. Earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization. So that's just basically saying, you know, how profitable are you? You know, what, what are your earnings in general? That What's that number? They'll look at certain numbers and say, this agency is a great agency. Can we buy you? We want to buy you. And that agency owner is like, great, I retire early. Awesome. This is fantastic. And we're able to kind of absorb, grab their clientele, make sure we absorb them into our ecosystem, as it were. We also have organic growth itself, just from there. It's not just through mergers and acquisitions. Organic growth is... Something that I didn't realize this until I joined PCF, but there's a lot of stability in the insurance world. A lot of stability. It was one of the essential, during COVID, it was one of the essential industries that had to stay open. Generally, that's one of the reasons why investors like the insurance world is because it's like slow and steady. You may not be growing at 50% a year, but in general, as far as your organic growth goes, but in general, like, Steady growth. It's a reliable investment, as it were. So we were the fastest growing company in Utah three different times. But we were growing so fast, I, I feel like we didn't do a good job of telling everybody about that because <laughs> we were just running so fast with mergers and acquisitions all over the country. And then we just won the award for the fourth fastest growing company in Utah. We have just shy of 5,000 employees. About 120, or sorry, 140, which I think this number is a little small now because we continually buy up places. So it's probably closer to 200, I would say, maybe 180 different offices or agencies that we bought. And they have sometimes numerous locations. So about 270 locations over 42 states. And we're a top 20 broker as far as just size, revenue size, premium, other things like that. So just a little bit about PCF. I'll pause here for a second. Even though it's kind of a lecture series, I'll pause to see is there any burning questions anybody has just about these things? Most people don't. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I never really looked into the insurance industry and hearing about this. It's really interesting. How did you get into the insurance industry? Okay. I frankly stumbled into it very recently. I was at third party recruiting for the early part of my career, which does anybody know what that is? Headhunter. Yeah, headhunter, yes. And I was just uh, actually telling uh, tell her this, that in 2007, I started jumping into recruiting after I've made a huge mistake, right? Like, okay, well, let me go into recruiting. And then after that, the economy crashed, Great Recession happens. And the way that me and it was me and my father trying to run things, the way we pivoted is we, we went to talk to mining companies because gold and silver were up when nobody else was hiring. So we had to like scour the earth looking for like Bill Foreman and people that know about how to 
take gold out of a place without ruining the environment or something like that. So there's a lot of that that we did. Then I went into the tech world after third, after some more third party recruiting. And then just last October, I joined PCF and learned a lot about the insurance world. So this is where I said, how come nobody told me this before? <laughs> this is this is where this is where I, I, I want to tell more people about it because it doesn't seem too exciting, right? It's very often it's people like, oh, it's not a very sexy industry. Everybody looks at all these other industries out there, but man, there's a lot of virtues to it. And how I got into it was basically a friend of mine said, JD, I've helped this company grow the best I can with my third party company, but you've now built, you've built an internal hiring apparatus of three different companies from scratch now. Can you come over and do it here? Because we don't have it set up yet. I was really excited because I didn't have any, any like predecessor that had set up, you know, standard operating procedures or anything like that. And it was just a gold deal I could run through. It was great. It was great. So um, I've learned a lot in the last year. That's really how I stumbled into it. And this is where a lot of people, they don't know about the insurance world except through like family members or something. Like, yeah, my cousin owns an agency. So they go work for their cousin or something like that. And this is what I hope will change. And I hope you guys will consider this industry. We'll jump over to the next uh, slide here. Here are some areas in which we, we can help different businesses. And there are, there are things called commercial lines and personal lines. Personal lines is like somebody's life insurance. So I could go to a broker and say, hey, I'm looking for a, a great life insurance policy that has these features with it. You know, tell me more, like who, who should I go to? What are the good rates? All this other stuff. And they have a few different carriers of life insurance policies that might be good for me. So they'll help me out making those decisions. Whereas in you know, being a business owner or maybe a small business owner, or maybe I own a ranch or something like that. How do I make sure that my crop is insured? How do I make sure that other aspects of what I'm doing is insured in case hopefully never happens in case calamity happens? I was recently talking to somebody who started in one of the other big brokerages, he started the agribusiness function there, essentially. One of his clients was Land and Lakes, you know, the butter. Okay. And they're massive operations. So they, they need to make sure, what if something happens here? What if like our fields flood or something like that? What if something happens with our dairy farms or our outside groups? We just need to make sure we have the right coverage just in case. And that's one of the things I think is actually really cool is that when you have insurance, you have peace of mind. I'm a very unlucky person. As soon as I don't have auto insurance, I had a gap for one day one time, and somebody broke into my car. I was like, no. So I'm a very unlucky person. Insurance companies love me, but I, it's because I want to insure everything because I know that it's, it's bound to happen. But it gives me peace of mind, and I love that. And that's really important. A business owner may work so hard for what they're doing, what they're building, and then calamity happens, and they have no way to do it with that. Yeah. So it sounds like you just, you mostly work business to business. Majority of our businesses, yes. And it's more to mitigate risk. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And to help them look at different policies. I mean, sometimes we have, uh, there is a wing of our business that is employer benefits and insurance there too, right? You go to an employer and they have a great dental plan or something like that. Awesome. Well, how can the broker help you? get a better dental plan next time, right? With lower premiums for your employees and for the company. The broker can help companies do that. They can help employees get better rates and better coverage in general and stuff like that. So that's the nice thing about, about being at a broker and working for a brokerage. So these are a lot of different areas. It's interesting, we, we even have a, an agency in Maine that specializes in marine insurance, in, right, in boats. It's like, oh, okay, didn't expect that in Maine. I guess they got some very deep water lakes, but but they also, I mean, they cover coast to coast. I don't know how they got that, but but over time, they just built more and more clientele and clients will refer people. Hey, my broker really took care of me. They got me great rates through this and I, I got great coverage as a result too. So these are some of the areas that you can look into. There's specialty areas too. So these specialty areas, you can be a broker, but you could also be somebody who specializes in senior benefits or Medicare. So there's a, there's a lot of details underneath that. Real estate, you need a lot of coverage with things in that realm as well. One of the things specific to the industry that I hope you will spread the word on, whether it's a PCF or anywhere else, just about the industry is, 
article came out last uh, last year, this is April of 23, I think, talked about the amount of people that are going to be retiring in the insurance world. 400,000 by 2036. And as you look at the second paragraph, the hiring pool is limited for entry-level experienced talent with 65% of people leaving an insurance job. And generally, they're also exiting the industry. They're retiring. So tons of opportunities coming. PCF and a lot of the big brokers, I can tell, they're all kind of planning ahead for it. Some of them are panicking a little bit. Like, oh, everyone's going to retire in the next five years. How do we get, you know, how do we cover everything? How do we cover our bases? PCF, we're planning ahead for that. And one of the things I found very interesting is opportunities to get into insurance are vast. There are many different ways to do that. You don't need a degree in risk management. You need specific insurance licenses, which most companies, most brokerages, at least, will take you in for the job. They'll give you the training for that, and then you take your licensing exam. I was told it wasn't that intense. I haven't taken it myself yet, but I was told it wasn't that intense, that it's, uh, I think, like 100 bucks, something like that, and you can take it many times to, until you pass it. So just like, do you guys know Fidelity down there? I've heard of okay. it. What's well, sorry? I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, Fidel Fidelity, they do an interesting and uh, a good job of, of bringing on staff and training them for their stockbrokers licenses and everything like that, their Series 6 and everything. More and more insurance companies are doing that too because it's not it's not very costly to them. You can start out in kind of a customer service role. You can train up. And you can go on account management or you can go on the sales side. So the sales side is very interesting. If you're really driven by monetary things, Insurance sales is a very interesting thing that I wish I had discovered a long time ago. I was like, I want to change everything if I knew this. <laughs> and the reason why is because you're, you're meeting with business owners to get them that coverage. But then after that, you're just making sure that they're taken care of. So these are the people that are going to golf all the time and stuff like that, just making sure that it's relationship-based. And I'm a relationship-based person, so I love recruiting. So if you like building and maintaining and keeping good business relationships, it's a great place to be. Somebody even, uh, the person who suggested I come up with PCF said, hey, in your first in your first meeting or so, when you're meeting all these people at a reception, a little conference, you're going to notice something. They're all relationship people, so I think you're going to understand. And, and when I went there, I was like, oh, these, this is my tribe. These are my people. Oh, my gosh. And so for the longest time, I was at tech companies, and, and not everyone in tech company is a people person, right? And that's okay. That's fine. But uh, but it was really, really cool just to go, oh, these are relationship owners. That's what they do. And so, so many people in insurance sales are making hundreds of thousands. After the Usually, the first two years is hard because you're building up your own clientele and everything. They'll give you a base uh, base salary and then, and then do a draw on that or something like that. But then after a while, you're just going off of commissions. I'm replacing somebody in California that has been doing insurance for a while, and just on Year over year, their commissions are 1.4 million. So I was like, I had no idea. Like, you don't need an advanced degree for this. This is amazing. So just something to, to think about, look into in case, in case you want to look into this or tell family members about it. Okay, go jump to the next one. Here's some, some just stats from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that I that I picked up here. I mean, this is for usual account management. When it talks about insurance sales agents, these are at carriers, so it's a little different. But I will say, when you look at underwriters and claims adjusters and things like that, the majority of those salaries are, you know, between 60 and 80. So either way, not a bad living, right? Not a bad living. And over time, the value for somebody who's a really good account manager goes up and up and up. And there's a ton of value to that. And more, since more and more people are leaving, companies are going to try to keep them more and more because you just get so much domain experience you might be an account manager that is a guru in sorry for the term uh in, in marine insurance or something like that right and that's really valuable so another thing to look at and consider we'll jump to the next one this is actually a table that shows unemployment in the industry for the last 10 years now unemployment rates are, this is just in insurance, obviously not national. What's the highest that you see on here? 4.8. 4.8. 4 
in July of 2020. Are we shocked? No. Okay. What was the, does anybody remember what the national unemployment rate at that time was? It was closer to like 14, 15%. So insurance has very low unemployment. If you want to stay in like employed in the insurance world, you're going to stay employed in the insurance world. You're going to be fine. Most experts in the HR world say full employment is about 2%. And the reason why is because there are just some people, you know, whether through disability or something like that, they can't work or can't participate in the labor market in the same way that other folks can. So they say, yeah, full employment is really close to like 2%. Look at how many times we're at 1% or 1.5 or something like that. A lot of opportunities, people tend to stay in the industry too. That's the other thing I thought was interesting about insurance. Like, yeah, I've been in insurance for 20 years. Really? Like, no one else is hopping around. They've, they've been at the same company for 15 years so often. And I'm like, that never happens, right? In most other industries. So a little interesting, a little crazy uh, in a lot of ways. Any questions on that? Any questions on just what's going on in the insurance world, brokerage world, anything? Yeah. What would you say is a key characteristic to get into sales and to be a sales agent? Oh, characteristic. Okay, but let me lump this in with some research that uh, the consulting company McKinsey did in, I want to say, 2014 and 15. They were trying to ascertain, hey, which, like, does it depend on which school somebody goes to? Is that, is that a determining factor of their success? No. You smell what I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there, there's a, a factor they said it's not even their GPA per se. It's not like sometimes people don't have a degree and that's not necessarily it. It's their learning that matters. But what really matters in the end and, and the biggest factor in somebody's success is perseverance or resilience. And there's a book by Angela Duckworth came out probably six or eight years ago. You guys know what I'm talking about? Grit. Yes. What's yeah. the word you said before with resilience? Perseverance. Perseverance. Perseverance, yep. That is a great name. If you want to do that, it's, it's more about the first two years being patient, building the relationships. It's okay if people say no. That's fine. It's understandable. Like, sometimes it's not the right thing for them. But if you just keep plugging away at it and you're actively striving, striving to take care of them, you'll do well. At least so I've heard from all the users that they're called producers very often if that's like the sales term. So they're called producers. And every time I talk to them, that's usually when it's like, oh, first two years are kind of tough because you're building things up. And after that, you just got to make sure that you're taking care of them. You're checking in with them. You know? You're doing your annual golf meeting or whatever, whatever that is. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah. So like the account managers, what's their kind of, I guess, more day-to-day -day versus like the, mm -hmm. like a salesperson, because it sounds like the sales, they're interacting with the clients a lot, but like yeah. account manager, what exactly are they going to be doing? Yeah. Like, do they assist <laughs> the salespeople with like, them? they do, they do. And in fact, a lot of the fulfillment of that is, is the, the people making sure the, the policy is, is written correctly. Do we have everything correct in there? Are we working with the carrier in the right way? So there's a lot of technical things you kind of do in the background and it comes with a lot of technical knowledge, but you are working with clients. It's just not to the same, not the same way, not the same extent. There's also even customer service reps that are, you know, they're starting at fairly normal rates of 20, 25 bucks an hour or something like that a lot of places. And they may not have the licenses to do the underwriting and everything like that and working in detail on policies, but they can answer questions and they can make sure they get problems to the right people that can provide the solutions, if that makes sense. So yeah. account management does have certainly client interface, just a little bit more technical in nature. Yeah. Good question. So who is it that needs the insurance license? Is it the account manager, the sales person, or the owner of the agency? All three. Oh, Great okay. question. And, and you need to make sure that your licenses are up to date for the state because things Things in each state are different. Right now, if you check out some things in the news, everybody's a little bit worried about Florida. I don't, has anybody heard about this? What's no, it's wrong with Florida. We're all worried about Florida. Okay. <laughs> Ever since I saw uh, alligators everywhere, I was like, what? No, uh, it, it was it more had to do with, uh, with what's going on in, in coverage and home coverage there. And how do they insure homes when you have hurricanes happening all of the time uh, and hitting Florida all of the time? Insurance companies are all leaving the state. 
they're like, we can't afford to do this. Like we just, it's not, it's not viable at all. So we're out. See ya. So the state is kind of trying to figure out the government's trying to say, do we have like a, if you own a home in Florida, you pay into our own insurance kind of thing. They might build their statewide level insurance specific for home insurance. But that's a lot of the complexity is, you know, you have to do a lot of risk calculation, just like when you get your auto insurance, they're doing a lot, they're running a lot of numbers to see how likely you are to, you know, have a car accident or something like that. Apparently I'm high risk. Uh, I'm just a really intense driver. Um, no, but but really, it, I mean, there's a lot of complexity state by state. So you do need your licenses specific to the state and everything like that. Again, I've been told that that they're not that intense, but they do want to, it, it is a good foundational. And now you are licensed to go do that in those three functions. Great question. Any others? All right, I'm going to hop over, switch gears real quick. Um, I'm going to hop over to the HR and recruiting world. Something that, of course, I, I obviously feel very passionate about or I wouldn't have stuck with it for so long. I love the ability that HR and talent acquisition professionals have to make change in a company. And so often, there are stigmas that have, that have held the industry back about HR. Toby from the office is one. Yeah, it's like the most common one. Everybody's like, yeah, Toby. So that's the like most common one people think about when they think about HR. My my concern is that there are a lot of people in this world that are administrators in HR, and they're not necessarily change makers. They're not necessarily people that see you. You can see the problems in the workforce, but are you actively trying to solve them? Are you working with the CEO to do that, or are you just kind of like handling the paperwork you got to hand? Uh, the reason why, sorry, the reason why I push that so hard is I want less people in the, in the HR world that are like Roz in Monsters Inc. So <laughs> less of those, please. And I want people who actually want to make change in organizations to want to crunch the numbers and say, hey, even if you're Ebenezer Scrooge, dear CEO, even if you don't care about people at all, theoretically, it actually behooves you to take care of them in all of these ways, to take care of your employees. And the numbers are there. And, and I, I, I just want more and more people in the industry that are excited about making that change because you can have a lot of impact. The interesting thing is that my team is rather small, but just on, at, at our corporate headquarters, we have interaction with literally every department because every department has to hire somebody. So we're seeing workforce problems. We're seeing in advance saying, oh man, maybe they're a little bit light staffed. How can we help? Is there any way that we can focus around? Sometimes I'm seeing work silos, and this happens at every company, but work silos all the time. Somebody's working on a project over here. These people are working on the same project. They don't think to check in with each other. So we're doing a good job of just like, or identifying. I, I call myself a silo breaker. because like, hey, hey, who else needs to be in the room on this? Who else needs to be discussed, like be brought in to this kind of project or whatever is it we're working on? And when you're in an HR function, you, you're able to see a lot of things. And so it's a really cool way to do that. We'll go to the, the next area. Now, these are functions that I particularly have, uh, I would say, expertise in over the last 15 to 20 years. And I bolded some of them that are new, different, that, are, that weren't around a little while ago, and that are emerging, I would say. The demand is increasing. You're probably going to get people come in here and talking about the, the changes that AI will be making in their industry. I'm certainly seeing AI have some impact in a couple of areas, and we can project, you know, we think it's going to also make changes in cybersecurity or whatever it is. But one field that's safe, HR. People need to interact with people. And there are some very core things that are really important to that. Now, now some transactional work are, is going to be lifted by technology all the time, right? All the better. <laughs> all the better. If a bot can handle questions about people's benefits or something like that, cool. But if they want to come talk to a person and, and, and discuss that, excellent. How can we make sure, understanding people's sciences, how can we make sure that we're really taking care of the workforce and, and making sure that performance is great and everybody's loving what they do day to day with engagement and these are complex problems to solve, though, in each organization, because each organization has different kinds of work. So how do you cover some of these areas? How do you make sure that um, 
see compensation on total rewards are, are where uh, where it needs to be. It became really, really competitive the last little while. It was kind of like a yeah, we got benefits checkbox. But then when all these tech industries started booming, or tech companies started booming, you know, 2014 and, and after, there became a really big competitive factor with uh, a competitive factor with total rewards saying um you, you can bring uh here are all the benefits and and here's all the other things and here's the perks and you can bring your pets and uh uh i mean they just started like panicking in their competition and started looking at okay what are the ways we can cover people holistically and make a better better place to work from the compensation and benefits side so that's why i say there's there's a lot of work to be done in that area still uh and a lot of opportunities for people I'll give people a second to take a look at this. And if you want to ask me anything about some of these areas afterwards, please do. I'd, I'd be happy to, to point you the right direction. What I, I do want to focus on, if you look at the uh, second and third bullet points, there's employer branding, recruitment, marketing. Does anybody know anything about that, those industries or those areas, those functions? Oh, yeah, she knows. Okay. Yeah, 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 awesome, awesome. Feel free to uh, chime in some of the things I'm going to address next. So I'm going to jump to the next slide. And here's, uh, we'll forgive, uh, ask forgiveness from our resident marketer here um, about some of these definitions. But essentially, this came from a, a training I, I gave members of my team a little while ago, talking about the HR or talent acquisition and recruitment side of marketing. So these are mar core marketing functions. If you look over here, we have Right, brand marketing, and I just have some very basic definitions. Um, it's it's not certainly not all encompassing, but it generally covers a lot of the bases, a lot of the subsets of marketing stuff. There's demand generation, lead generation. Um, that's uh, looking at uh, org social, paid social, pay per click, you know, ad placement, all these kinds of different things. There, that's the the technical ad placement side of things, and up to brand marketing, you know, who you are and how you want to be perceived as a business. So, uh, and, and how can you move that perception in the direction you want to go conscientiously? You have the same mirror over on the right-hand side with talent and employer brand. Um, a lot of these are, are key things that most organizations are not doing, but they have an opportunity to do with the right knowledge base there. Now, let me give you a few examples here. Um, who you are as, uh, as a company or, or your brand does affect how people perceive working there. People perceive working at Apple as a really cool thing, right? Oh, it's so cool because the products are so cool, right? So people have certain perceptions about your organization that cross over to wanting to work there. Um, at the same time, what about that person that makes watches over here? Like, how, how do you? Not Rolex. I mean, if you're not really well known, how do you how do you put together messaging on why you should come work there? It's not just a list of perks. Perks are cool things, but they don't ultimately determine what makes us happy at work. The work that you do is a huge factor as well, and who you work with and how they treat you, right? Are there development opportunities? Are you have seven people trying to stab you in the back and make you look bad? You know what I mean? All these are, are factors in the workplace um, that you can develop messaging around to say, why should people want to work here? You can try to understand your, has anybody looked into buyer persona analysis or anything? Okay. That's essentially doing an analysis to say, okay, who's our buyer and why would they want our product? Like, who are the, who are the types of people that would want our product? Um, if I were to say, I'm selling, um, oh gosh, CDs, who's, who's the market for that? Who would you sell that to? It's a small market, a niche market, yeah? I feel like that could go two ways. I would either say like the older generation or the new, newer generation where they're buying, the, they're buying like vinyl records and all that trying to tap into the new. There you go, there you go. So you will just identify two different uh, buyer persona groups, right? You can do more of an analysis like who, who would really want this? But they're niche. So how do you go to them? You don't do mass marketing. You don't spend bajillions of dollars telling everyone about it. You, how do you find them and tell them and the watering holes that they're at, that they go to? Um, so we have to do the same thing with jobs in the future. We have to do better and better job of, of doing a candidate persona analysis. Who would want this job? 
Who actually wants it? Why do they want it? How do we speak to them? How do we message them? Let me give you a quick example. In a job ad, most of the time, people are companies not spending the time. They're just like Googling best job ad for this, stick it up on their, on their careers page and because they're running so fast. Now, most of the time, they're missing an opportunity there. Uh, at a company I worked at previously, they loved hiring ex-teachers. And one of the things I knew about Utah is that people were leaving the teaching world a lot. About four to six years in, they're like, nah, I'm done with teaching. I'm out. See ya. So they'll leave teaching, and we wanted to capture that. So what we would do is we would lace into our, into our job ad terminology for SEO purposes and other things. We would say, we want you to teach and educate our clients. And we would use those terms a few times. And then somebody would search teaching and education jobs, and we would pop up next to all the teacher jobs. Good way to capture our audience after we did the buyer or so analysis. So there's a lot of really interesting things you can do to capture secondary, tertiary uh, candidate persona groups and, and pull them into a job area and, and pull attraction in. And, and this is why I want to say there's a whole wing of marketing underneath the talent acquisition world that is really untapped. And the jobs, it is a brand new field. It wasn't even talked about until about eight years ago. Eight years ago, people were like, wait, maybe we should do this thing. And everyone's like, what's employer branding? Like people are still trying to define it and everything like that. And there's a few experts out there. Not a lot of people know really what they're talking about in this world, but it's a, that's why it's a really cool kind of disruptive opportunity. And that's what's gonna, we see all these problems in the labor market, the future, with baby boomers retiring, and you have all these jobs that you need to hire people for. Um, if you wanna go to an, into accounting, I pity the accounting world. Because how are they going to attract people like I do too? <laughs> and no, just because I I see that uh, I think the BLS uh, reported that it's projected that they're going to the U.S. is going to have a deficit of ten thousand accountants needed per year for the next ten years. So how are the accounting companies going to pull people in? Like, if what if you're a small accounting CPA company? How do you how do you do that? Right. So. They have problems that they're going to need to try to solve. AI is going to make an impact on that. They'll do some of the basic bookkeeping. But how do you pull more people into the industry? How do you diversify that industry? Right? A lot of times that is a, that has traditionally been a more male-dominated group. So how do you pull in more females? How do you pull in more groups into that? Because we know the diversity of thought actually creates higher-performing teams. Sorry, passion's coming out. I get really excited about this kind of stuff. So I, I get excited about solving these problems too for companies. How do we message these things? Um, we had a sales job uh, at a previous company I worked at too, and nine out of ten applicants were men. And that's that's just how it statistically ends up being the case in Utah very often. You post any sales job, but we wanted a, a diversified group, a gender diversified group coming in. So we're like, okay, how do we do that? Well, we change the language of the job ad a little bit. Sometimes language will dissuade people the wrong way or pull the wrong or pull more people in. So we just change the language a little bit. We change the title and we call the HR solutions person because we wanted to pull from the HR industry because that's about 70, 30 female to male. So like, okay, let's, let's do that. After we started doing some analysis, we tried to pull people in. We recognized there was a 60-40 split of applicants. Oh, so cool. So cool. Um, all right. We'll continue from here. One thing, I, all the, yeah, sorry. Uh, one thing I noticed on there, the first day of class when I teach intro to marketing, mm -hmm. I asked the students, what are some of the jobs where you could use your marketing skills? And I talked about a bunch of different jobs, and then also what are some of the tasks within those jobs? And this is probably in there somewhere, and I'm not seeing it, but yeah. um, internal communication with current employees to promote the brand. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, our internal comms person, it's her last week, and, and I worked so closely with her that I'm like, no, I can't. Like, And, and we're you know trying to back to them and everything. But internal communications is really important because people have different perceptions, and it's not necessarily... It's not necessarily all encompassing of the company, right? It's like they have a perception of the company based on their team and who they interact with day to day. That's not necessarily what the CEO thinks or whatever it is. And how can you manage these internal communications? There's quite a lot to be done. They work closely with HR teams. So 
Um, yeah, awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, we'll go to the next one and just uh, kind of closing things out, like what I wanted to make sure you guys knew about is that there's many different opportunities that have not been seen before or just very recent in nature. The only time in the past that there was a recruitment marketing job was if you worked at like IBM or HP back in the day. But it was so niche that very few people were qualified to do it. Well, now that world is expanding, and I can tell people that they could move from uh, employer brand into other brand functions or vice versa, right? Um, there's a lot of disruption happening with AI. But there's a lot of really cool opportunities we haven't even seen yet. And so the, it behooves all of us to just continually learn to network, to establish new relationships, because a lot of these relationships I was talking, telling you about on, on LinkedIn that you can start connecting with people on, you'd be surprised how many people like myself are like, yeah, be happy to do a call sometime and help somebody look into a career or connect with other people. Um, just take a minute to do that and explore. Um, I, I hope the insurance industry would pull back the curtain a little bit. It doesn't seem like the most exciting place at first, but then you start looking into it going, that's a really cool career track. And some people may say the same thing about HR after seeing Toby, they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go into HR. Uh, but there's so much impact you could have from an organizational standpoint. And that matters to me, at least. That matters uh, in what I do day to day. So thanks very much for having me. Uh, any any other questions? Any questions at this point? Yeah. So I'm a marketing major and I have two questions. Um, what would you say the demand for employer marketing is in the insurance industry regarding AI? And what stuff would you recommend for someone to get started in the industry? Mm, wait, wait, can you say that one more time at the yeah. beginning of it? I want to make sure you got Yeah. It. So what would you say is a demand for employer uh, branding marketing in this in the insurance industry regarding AI? Mm -hmm. And what steps would you recommend for someone start trying to get into the industry? Mm, okay. Um, great question. Uh, as far as AI goes, there's a lot of there's a lot of HR tech companies, applicant tracking systems, HRIS systems, things like that, that they are. They're saying, we have an AI tool. They're all like jumping on the bandwagon and everyone's trying to, blah, blah, blah. but whether it's good or not, whether it's like works the way it should, whether it's actually needed is still being fleshed out in that world and to what extent it's needed. Um, so when it comes to that, I, I, don't, I see some opportunities for systematic display advertising when you're looking at, at a way to advertise jobs. Now, as far as disrupting the insurance world, talent brand and, and employer brand, uh, I was surprised. Insurance, these big brokers, I, I started calling uh, people that worked at my, competitive, uh, my competitors at other top 10 brokerages across the country. I just hit up a lot of recruiters and said, hey, do you want to talk sometime? And they're like, okay, sure. They just spilled the beans on everything about their, their recruiting and talent, and talent brand stuff. They're all having problems and they're stuck in legacy systems, kind of old ways of thinking. All of these recruiting team members would tell me this, like, it's not disorganized. It's not very organized here. We're pretty disorganized. So there is a need and demand in that world, in the insurance world, because they're just doing the way thing. They're doing things the way they've been done in the past, not innovating. That's what I actually really love about PCF. In a lot of ways, it feels a little bit more like the movement of a tech company. We're fast moving. It's very entrepreneurial, and as a result, we can make change. I can do things that the senior director of talent acquisition and another big broker can't do. That just they're having too much red tape or whatever it is. So I think we can disrupt that. I see the, the need and demand. I don't know if they see it yet. I think in the next two, three years, they're going to be panicking a little bit more. <laughs> it's like, we're losing everyone. How many great people live? Great question. Great question. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know, does your does this insurance company do any um, you know, community outreach or any type of like mutual aid stuff, um, you know, for the working class or just like people under that class. Well, uh, keep going. Give, give me a few more for instances. Um, I'm just thinking a lot about like the unsheltered community and different things like that. So I don't know if that's something that you guys think about or if it's something that you, you know, prioritize? I would, I would say we grew so fast. This is very common fast growing companies. We grew so fast that right now we're doing a good job. And it's one of the reasons why I came over to PCF is I see hyper growth as mostly 
a problem more than it is a good thing because you, you don't have enough time to put the right pieces in place and the right people in the right jobs and everything. So tech companies would be like, we're hyper growth. Like, that's dangerous. Everyone's overworked and they're exhausted and stuff like that. Right. But but at, at PCF, I found out that at the second half of 23, they were stopping to say, let's make sure we have the right structures in place. We're being thoughtful. We're not going to go out and acquire as fast as we did in the past because we need to make sure everything's functioning the way it should. And one of those areas, I would say, has to do with the community outreach group. So I, I know there's a lot of different things that we that we do that PCF does for sure. I have a hard time keeping track of them because there's a lot. Some of them are more localized. Um, uh, I, I know our, our regional vice president in Texas had a, a very big thing in Houston where he and his agency and agency partners kind of got together and had a barbecue for the homeless. And so it was really, really cool to be able to see what they were doing there. As far as the, the company goes, I mean, we're going to a, a benefit here pretty soon. There's a lot of sponsorship of, of benefit events. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say I would say it's I'm probably not the best person to talk about that, but but there is a, a social responsibility that companies are responding to, and I, and PCF is definitely part of that. Awesome. So yeah. Great question. Thank you. Any others? So you talk about like the company growth and like acquiring different like groups and small mom pop shops, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So how does that work with integrating into PCF? Is it like you rebrand them, they keep their branding, and now that you're just the parent company and they operate independently, or like yeah. what's that relationship like? Really excellent. It's it's at each brokerage, it's kind of different. Some of them will say, just keep your own brand, keep doing what you're doing. We're just gonna centralize your accounting functions so we know that you're not cooking the books or something like that, right? Um with us, we, we kind of were doing that at the beginning because we didn't have enough time to manage that kind of change and everything. And we're like, you know, you obviously have been doing good work up until now. Your EBITDA is excellent. Like you have good earnings and everything like that. So let's not rock the boat. Just join the PCF family. And as a central shared services group, we'll try to lighten your load a little bit, right? So they can come to us with other needs and help and things like that from a, a shared marketing team perspective, right? They don't, not every single agency has their own marketing person. Like some of them have five people there. Some of them have 150, so they may. But but still, we have shared services. We can help grease the wheels for everybody. Now you're seeing a little bit more of a consolidation of PCF, and it's 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 kind of needed. We're like, all right, we need to rein it in a little bit better. That doesn't mean we're branding rebranding overnight. But some places that rebrand overnight. I was just on the phone with somebody a couple months ago that said. Yeah, they, they really quickly rebrand the agency, but they also kick the person out the door without telling them that, okay, we just bought your agency. Next day, you're fired. <laughs> and like, and then the person who built that company up just like kick them out the door. They pay them for their agency, but they kick them right out the door and they rebrand everything as quickly as they can. So there's a balance. And integration is actually one of the most complex things you can do. And we have a whole integrations team devoted to that now. And it was actually a huge two-hour topic in our in our big all hands HR meeting just last week was how can we make sure we have cleaner, smoother integrations? Because that's painful, right? We buy an agency and all of a sudden their whatever benefits they had with the, the former owner now switch over to us. They need to know a lot of things. How do they access that, that, that stuff from the systems perspective? A lot of complexity. So there's a lot of because so many different industries are actually consolidating, a lot like the brokerage world, there's a lot of opportunity for people to know systems and integrations and change management. That's another really cool field to look into. So, great question. Any others? Hey, one last, one last question. Yes. What was the big mistake you made in college? What were you studying? <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I loved my undergrad. I loved what I was learning. But I realized I was not going to be a professor in this world, and it was it was ancient Near Asian studies. So I was like Egyptology, Assyriology, loved history and the historicity of those things. And then about three years in, I was like, I can't go to twelve more years of grad school. Can't do it. I can't. And so, and and it's you know it's a difficult field in a lot of ways. If you don't go to like Harvard or Yale, you ain't getting a job. No matter you know no matter how how good you are or whatever it is. So. I saw a lot of a lot of things there where I go, I don't want to just write papers forever and have my only 2% of my peers even read them. Like, and if I wanted to teach, it would be something like this, right? 
that I that's the reason why I got it. I, I just wanted to help people. And I figured I could help actually help people in job transitions and career transitions. So. Um, 